Hello, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation brought to you by, you would guess that I was going to say the 2023 Toyota BZ4X, but no, today and forever, we will be brought to you by the 2024 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps. The BZ4X will get you through it all. Like I said, totally different vehicle. That's why I have a totally different ad read for it as well. The 2024 Toyota BZ4X and Pacific Toyota dealers are who Canucks conversation is brought to you by. My name is Dave Quadrelli. That is Harmon Dial. We're coming to you remotely because it is a Vancouver Canucks game day. Busy show today, Harm. Busy show. Uh, before we get to Jeff Patterson and before we get to tonight's game against the Vegas Golden Knights, we unfortunately have to start with Saturday night's 6-3 to three loss to the Los Angeles Kings. Hey, the loss, Los Angeles Kings, something there, maybe. Um, 6-3 loss for the Vancouver Canucks. Where do you want to start when we talk about that game? Well, honestly, I think the game is over as soon as you go down 2-0 against a team of the Kings caliber, how stifling they are defensively. You just can't create that type of hole. And when you look at Vancouver's lack of success against LA so far in the regular season, you have to keep in mind that the Kings have scored the first goal every single time. That matters massively because the Kings are a team that if you score first on them, now all of a sudden they're a team that they have to open things up. They can't just sit back in their 1-3-1. And now all of a sudden they're a team that they themselves are only middle of the pack offensively. So now you potentially expose their weakness in can they come from behind? Can they manufacture enough offense? Do they have the same star level that other top Western Conference teams do offensively? But the Canucks have never been able to put themselves in a situation to exploit that LA weakness because they consistently go down in these games. And uh, of course, as far as going down 2-0, a, a multitude of factors there, right? Um, number one, I thought both calls were kind of borderline in terms of the Bluger one. And uh, and the second one, was it Zadorov who took that penalty? Uh, Joshua. Joshua, my bad. I think Joshua took the first one, but regardless, yeah, your point is I got them mixed up. But um, point being, like, both calls were kind of borderline. Out of the two goals, I think DeSmith probably should have had that second dowdy one from from distance. Um, So there's the goaltending aspect there. And then, of course, on the first goal, for example, uh, and Kevin Bieksa did a great job of breaking it down during the intermission, how Nikita Zadorov was unable to take the far side, um, blocking the shooting lane for Adrian Kempe because DeSmith's spot on the uh, job in that PK, his responsibility is taking that close, the, the near side and the middle of the net. It's not to take that far side, and it was a perfect snipe by Kempe. So just the combination of those factors, you can't go down to nothing against a team like LA, and uh, that's uh, ultimately what um, what haunted them. Plenty of interaction so far in our YouTube live chat. Uh, Nux for Cup, and I think he says it best here, that game was over the second they took their first penalty. Absolutely. Obviously, LA scores, and from there, you're, not, you're just not coming back against that team. We know that that's the case uh, with LA, and again, them jumping out to an early two-goal lead. You're, you're playing right into their strengths, right? Um, Karen Versation, brutal start to the game penalty-wise. Uh, DeSmith didn't help either. And Bain, pull this up, Grady, the uh, Pacific Division standings right now because we declared it over last week when we saw Darnell Nurse's pinch against the Dallas Stars. But Harm right now, at the time of this recording, the Edmonton Oilers just three points back of the Canucks with a game in hand. I have to ask you, do you think the Edmonton Oilers might catch the Vancouver Canucks? These two teams play on Saturday, and then the Oilers will have three games after that. The Canucks still have the upper hand, but it's getting a little too close for comfort now, especially because of that head-to-head contest. And really the key from Edmonton's perspective is they beat Colorado, and then on the sec- and not just beat, they annihilated them on the scoreboard. And then on the second half of back-to-back, also beat Calgary. Like That's a very tough two-game stretch on the schedule. Um, of course, on the second half against Calgary, not because Calgary is a great team, but just because you're you're tired in that situation. Um, so for Edmonton to pull out the, those two victories, like that's 
that's an unlikely scenario that has made the race more interesting than it should be. I'm curious. I'm curious how it's going to go uh, down the stretch here. One thing that before the game on Saturday that the Canucks will be looking to write, and they have a chance to write it tonight, is the title of today's episode, The Canucks Keep Losing to Playoff Teams. Rob Williams at Daily Hive kind of set this off when he pointed out the last time the Canucks beat a playoff team was the game Thatcher Demko went down on March 9th against the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Demko leaves in the second period. DeSmith sees out the shutout. Uh, that was the last time the Canucks won a game against a playoff team. Harm, over that time, a loss to Colorado, a loss to the Washington Capitals, which, yes, we are counting the Capitals as a playoff team, a loss to the Kings and the Stars, and then, obviously, most recently, uh, Vegas 6-3 on Tuesday last week, and then 6-3 to to the LA Kings as well. Vegas in town tonight. Canucks have a chance to buck that trend, but Harm, this is coming up on a month. If they lose tonight, it is a full month that they have not beat a playoff team in a National Hockey League game. That is a concerning trend, I would think. I have to ask you, obviously it correlates with the fact that Demko's gone down. How much are you reading into it? Like, is it a concern for you? Uh, should fans be concerned about this, this trend that we're seeing develop? Okay, so I did the math on this, and I'm not including Washington, Washington as a playoff team because they're not in a playoff position right now. But for the season as a whole, the Canucks are 21, 14, and 4 against playoff teams. To me, that's a pretty good record. That's a 96-point pace, which would still be playoff caliber, looking only at Vancouver's games against top 16 teams in the NHL. And before that stretch, before Demko went down, they'd won four of their last five games. And in fact, even if you look at, I think everybody looks at the all-star break as the, the turning point when the Canucks haven't been rolling teams over all of a sudden, and that's when question marks have started to come up. Well, if you look at Vancouver's record against playoff teams since the All-Star break, but before Demko's injury, it's still a respectable 6-4-1. and one. So to me, the concern I have isn't, oh, are the Canucks frauds against playoff caliber teams? Because the evidence for the season as a whole just doesn't bear that out. But the concern I have is how much confidence do you have in your special teams sorting themselves out? Because you look at this five-game um, losing stretch against playoff teams without Demko, and what's fascinating is that at five on five, the Canucks have only been outscored 10 to nine. So it, at even strength, they've actually been holding their own pretty well. But you look at their penalty kill. Eight goals against on 19 power play opportunities in that stretch. 57% on the PK and power play on top of that one for 11 clicking at 9% plus you consider the fact that LA they also scored a shorthanded goal in the Canucks so Vancouver's power play is basically neutral goal differential across these uh five games and so then you look at the individual storylines right in the most recent LA game you go down to nothing courtesy two power play goals game's already over by that point um, the Vegas game, that's a little bit different because they were also a mess at even strength, but in that game, Vegas, uh, netted two power play goals, the Dallas game, a close three, one contest, which really was a one goal hockey game because Dallas added an empty netter at the end. Dallas had two power play goals. The Canucks went over three on the power play. Um, the time before, before that, when the Canucks played the LA Kings, LA didn't score a power play goal, but they did score on an extended six on five shift with a delayed penalty. And meanwhile, Vancouver's power play went over two. And then in the Colorado game, 4-3 OT loss, Colorado got two power play goals and Vancouver's power play didn't produce on the man advantage. So to me, then you also look at Vancouver's best stretch against playoff caliber opponents. It's the first month of the season when they were 7-1-1 from October, 11, October 11th to November 10th. 7-1-1. In that stretch, Vancouver's power play ranked top three in the NHL, and their PK was smack in the middle league average. So there's a clear correlation there that if Vancouver's special teams are firing on all cylinders, yeah, they can beat these um, top teams. But we're entering a stretch now where when we discuss the special teams, it isn't just these last five games against playoff caliber opponents because since the also break, power play ranks 24th, the PK ranks 23rd, the only playoff team besides Vancouver that ranks below league average in both special teams categories since the All-Star break are the New York Islanders. I'm just wondering if they have time to write the ship. 
Like, I'm just looking at the schedule here. Canucks have five games left. And, and all you, you brought up very, very valid points, Harmon. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to poke holes in it at all. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's just, I'm a bit concerned. I'll just be honest. I'm a bit concerned with the lack of success against playoff teams recently. And someone in the chat here, uh, Nux for Cup again, 3-7-1 versus Western playoff teams in 2024. It just, it's starting to feel like the Canucks are just going cold at the wrong time. But I also don't want to take away the fact that they haven't got the goaltending lately. And again, I think when this streak kind of started, you could pin more of it on the guys in front of them. Lately, I think Casey DeSmith hasn't given the Canucks the saves they need. Uh, the Canucks go with Archer Seelofs tonight. I thought they would do that on Saturday night. They're doing it tonight against the Vegas Golden Knights. And I saw this on Twitter. People talking about, oh, don't throw Seelofs to the Wolves of the Golden Knights. You've got to know if this guy can be your NHL backup. No more coddling. And hell, I was saying this exact same thing last year when people were like, don't put Seelofs in against the Rangers. This guy's the most even keel goaltender person maybe that I've ever met in my life. You ask him, oh, what was it like facing NHL shooters? Uh, yeah, you know, it was it was fast. Like, those are his responses. He's not shaken by anything. Uh, I like the idea of going with Arch Seeloffs tonight. None of this, don't coddle the young goaltender and be like, oh, don't throw him against the Wolves. You've already done it. This isn't Mikey DiPietro versus the San Jose Sharks, just like it wasn't last year. Seeloffs getting the NHL taste last year helped him big time, uh, and I would think tonight is going to help him big time as well. He faces a playoff team. He gets the chance to help the Canucks buck this trend of losing to playoff teams, especially Western Conference playoff teams. Really quickly, wanted to jump in there. Fully agree with uh, the decision to start C-Lobs. And just to follow up on, on what I was saying, my point in bringing up the special teams wasn't to say, oh, there's nothing to see there. I'm not worried about the Canucks against playoff teams at, at all. The point was, I'm not so much focused on the caliber of opponent. I'm just focused on, can you get your power play going? Can you get your uh, penalty kill fixed? And this is where... To me, the PK, can you get it up to league average? Um, once you get Elias Lindholm back, once you get Thatcher Demko back, I think it's possible. The power play, though, that's where I'm worried. Because, again, you want to talk about the first month of the season when the Canucks were most successful against playoff opponents, 7-1-1. One, one. Their power play wasn't just good. It was elite, as in 32.7%. And I'll be honest, I don't have confidence that the power play is going to get back to that level. That's a, again, that's what it comes down to is do they have time to write the ship? Do they have time to get back to uh, that kind of form? It's going to, it's going to matter a lot quickly before we get to Jeff Patterson, who's standing by. Uh, last thing I want to say about the game against Kings, I thought it was a really strong game from Elias Patterson. I thought Elias Patterson played really well. I didn't see much, so I don't want to give it too much credit, but I did still see the where's Elias Patterson when you need him crowd on Twitter. I thought Elias Patterson had a really strong game. And again, only one point but a really strong game from Elias Patterson on Saturday night. Yeah, he had six shots. He, um, of course, set up Brock Besser with the primary assist, a really patient high IQ play to hold on to the puck, wait till Besser had an angle to drive to the net. And then on top of that, the partial breakaway set up by Pod Coles in, in uh, the first period that uh, Cam Talbot denied him on, uh, drew a penalty in the second period. Then in the third period, sprung Garland for a breakaway, set up Besser on the, po on the power play in the third period for a chance right on the doorstep that he probably buries half, half the time. Uh, he was noticeable. He was dangerous. He was setting, a, setting up a lot of scoring chances. And the point wasn't that, oh, this is Elias Patterson at his best, because there were still some shifts where I was like, okay, I want to see him a bit harder on the puck. But for a player that's been way too quiet since the All-Star break, this was at least a step in the right direction in the sense that, okay, I'm noticing him at least creating offense more shifts than not. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's all you want to see right now. You want to, again, what are the trends heading into the playoffs? Look, the trends and the vibes, if you lose a lot of games down the stretch here and it ends up with Edmonton getting first in the Pacific, uh, a choke job like that is not the vibes that you want heading into the playoffs, as I state uh, very, very obvious. But let's get to Jeff Patterson, who is brought to you by, check this out, the CA playoff shirt the Canucks army playoff shirt the playoffs are near and we have an army nation gear is ready to gear you up for vancouver's playoff run rep your favorite team as they battle for the cup shop the exclusive we have an army playoff tee and more at nationgear.ca all right let's bring him in uh jeff patterson joins us now jeff hosted the first live version of rink wide vancouver on saturday night and jeff 
Thank you for joining us. How did that li live show go? I watched it. It looked great. What do you think of it? No, I'm here to tell you the stories that I survived it. That, uh, so that, that makes it a success right then and there. Uh, technically, it went great. We had a lot of help behind the scenes. Good to get the first one in anything in life out of the way. And so uh, it wasn't a great game, but I think there is that angst in the market that you guys were just talking about. So uh, we were happy with the viewership and the listenership and something to build on and uh, five to go here in the regular season. And then as uh, you guys have been talking about, uh, we'll be there for the playoffs and we'll see how long that playoff run lasts for the Vancouver Canucks. I thought you were going to say I hosted the the Botchford Project uh, alumni event on Friday, and you guys were there as well. So thanks for uh, supporting that. We had a great night, uh, great hospitality shown by the Canucks at the Warriors game. So yeah, busy weekend uh, for me and you guys, and obviously for the Vancouver Canucks as well. Busy, busy weekend, but the Canucks couldn't get you a win on Saturday for your first episode of Rinkwide Live. Uh, it's not about getting me a win, Quads. Don't worry, it's not. they're not playing for me, I can tell you that much. Have you tried asking anybody if they are? You should. You should have told them that it was the first episode of Rink White. Uh, Jeff, what did you think of that game? We were just kind of talking about it. We're talking about some concerning trends down the stretch here for the Canucks. But uh, Saturday night's game, what did you think of it? Casey DeSmith got brought up in uh, our initial conversation of it. What did you think of Saturday night's game? Yeah, without repeating too much, and I was listening, I agree with you. Uh, you, know, you got to show a little bit of discipline. I thought Dakota Joshua, I thought there could have been coincidental minors there. You know, he gets his gloves up into the face of Akil Thomas, but I thought Thomas got a shot. Ian, the Canucks have just been scored on on a power play. Kind of thought NHL officiating would try to lower the temperature, send both guys off, but they elected to pick one. And, and look, Joshua put the referees in a position. He definitely gets a shot in there. Uh, and then you got to be able to kill off a penalty at some point. I didn't like the first power play goal. I know you talked about the Doughty shot from the middle of the ice harm. I just thought on the Kempe one, and look, credit to Kempe. That was a big-time shot. Uh, he's a big-time player for them. But I thought Casey DeSmith, there was a great overhead look at the goal. He had lost his net there. He was way too far to his left. And then Zadorov doesn't do enough to take away the shooting lane. So a sniper like Kempe, he's going to pick his spot. And he did there. So terrible start. Uh, discipline was an issue for the Vancouver Canucks. And yet I thought for the final 15 minutes of the first period, I thought they actually clawed their way back. Bester scores to make it a one-goal game. And then we're all waiting for the signature moment from Elias Pettersson. If he scores on that partial breakaway... Like people are saying, all right, there's the, you know, the guy that signed this big contract and, you know, he's pulled this team back uh, onto even terms, but I'll, you know, again, he got a decent look there. Uh, Coulda, woulda, he didn't score. And unfortunately they continued to chase the game. And, you know, for me, beyond the fact that they gave up the first goal in all four against the Kings, it's the fact that they didn't play with the lead for a second against Los Angeles in four games. So you talk about the definition of chasing, even in their win, they had to come back from one down, they tied, and then they won eight in overtime. So they never had the lead for a single second. Talk about you know trying to take the Kings out of their comfort zone and forcing them to ad adjust and adapt and everything else. And so you know, five on five for the rest of the first period, I didn't mind the way the Canucks played, but then again, they fell further behind and now you're chasing. So uh, they've got to be better. Like The top of their lineup has to be better. The bottom of their lineup, look, they wasted a goal from Teddy Bluger. We haven't seen one of those things like an eclipse. Uh, we haven't seen one of those things in forever. And unfortunately, uh, it didn't matter. Uh, but they're getting nothing from the bottom of the lineup. And I'm really curious tonight, like Rick Tockett was hinting after the morning skate that we might see 11 and 7 again, like we did in Arizona. I think they want to get Noah Juleson in to help out on the penalty kill. And there are so many candidates, and Tockett wouldn't, he didn't divulge whether he's going to go that way. But if he does, you know, is it Pia Suter that comes out again? He was playing the wing with Nils Amon at the morning skate. Is it Amon that comes out of the lineup? Whatever the case, they're, they're just, again, getting very little from the bottom of the lineup, as we know. And I'm delighted. Like, I, I, I'm excited for Arthur Silovs. I think this guy has earned the opportunity. He's taken on Anaheim and Arizona. This is a step up in a huge way. But not only did he face the Rangers in his NHL debut last year, he faced a Boston Bruins team that had an historic run in the NHL. Like they were not just the best team in the NHL last season. They were the best team by miles. He was the other goalie the night that Linus Olmark came to town and, and scored the empty netter. So he has faced some good opponents, but just in terms of the stakes that are at play this late in the season, easily his biggest test, but he's looked good in his two games so far this year. So I'm excited. And you know, quite frankly, Casey DeSmith didn't look very good last week in Vegas and didn't look all that great against Los Angeles. So why not throw a bit of a wild card into the mix here? Throw the throw the Golden Knights a different look and, you know, see what happens. But I, I'm pretty confident. Like, I, you know, Canucks may not win this game, but I am confident that Arthur Silas is going to hold up his end of the bargain. I think there might be other reasons that the Canucks don't get the result that they're looking for. 
Jay Pat, we've spent a lot of time talking about the power play struggles, but lately now the PK has started to slip up uh, as well. Do you think sorting out the penalty kill is as simple as getting Thatcher Demko and Elias Lindholm back, or do you see issues beyond that? Well, and I wrote about this at Canucks Army over the weekend that, you know, when you think of areas that the Canucks like spent and spent big time last off season to address, it was the worst penalty kill in the National Hockey League. So they made the Philip Ronick trade and they didn't do it with an eye to the penalty kill, but he's become a big part. And, and obviously he only played the four games last year, but in free agency, Ian Cole and Carson Soucy and Teddy Bluger and Pia Suter. And they've got these, you know, the coaching systems and structure in place, all of that. And their penalty kill is 18th in the NHL over the season. Like I, for all of the talk of the great acquisitions and there have been a lot of nice pieces added, but just collectively, the guys that they brought in to do the job, like, have they improved from 32nd? Yeah. I mean, there's nowhere to go but up. But 18th is below league average. And and certainly since the All-Star break, there have been some issues. Now, to your question, Harm, you know, what is the common denominator here? They gave up four power play goals in that crazy 10-7 loss to Minnesota. They gave up three or two in the Colorado game that you pointed out, two to Dallas, two in Vegas last week, two Los Angeles. Casey DeSmith's been in goal for all of those. So would Thatcher Demko have given you a couple more saves along the way? I think it's fair to say that, yeah, he probably would have. Would the Canucks have won all of those games? I can't sit here and say that. But I, I do feel pretty comfortable saying that Demko would have just somehow found a way to give you a few more saves while you were shorthanded. But, you know, if they do insert Noah Juleson tonight, I think that's an indication that uh, the guys that they've gone with here the last few games haven't been getting it done. And it is kind of crazy this late in the season that you have to turn to a guy who is sort of your seventh best defenseman and feel that you need him in there for that one specific area of the game. But, you know, when I look at kind of how the Canucks are getting towards Dallas, that Jamie Ben goal, the down low play into the bumper, even Arizona, the one goal they gave up against Arizona was a quick down low and into the bumper. Uh, Doughty wasn't so much the bumper, but he was the middle of the ice. Like, talk, it always talks about the guts of the ice and taking away the guts of the ice. And I think the Canucks have been exposed a little bit there on the penalty kill of late. So, uh, interested to see the way they deploy their players tonight. And if Juleson is in there and how much penalty killing does he do? Ultimately, the other thing too is like when Teddy Bluger takes penalties, now all of a sudden with Lindholm out of the lineup, JT Miller is forced to be one of your primary penalty killers. And we know that that's uh, JT does so many good things for the Canucks, but he's not one of their best penalty killers. And yet he continues to be in the rotation. But if Bluger, who has, and I was surprised at this because I looked it up since the All Star break among Canuck forwards, Teddy Bluger has taken more minor penalties than anybody since the All Star break. And, and I just, you know, again, tighten things up. You don't think of Teddy Bluger as a, you know, a dirty player or a guy that crosses the line, but there have been too many penalties creeping into his game. And he is one of their better penalty killers. And, you know, I, I think also just the mention of Elias Lindholm, like the fact that he's been out of the lineup here. Yeah, the offense hasn't been there for him since the trade, but can the guy win you a late faceoff? Absolutely. And he had become part of their penalty killing rotation. And I, I so I'm not surprised that with Demko out and Lindholm out that you are seeing a dip. Now, the question is, how quickly can they get them back? How quickly can they get them fully up to speed? And what kind of difference can they make? But Look, the Canucks are a better team when they have Lindholm and Demko in the lineup. So we'll see how things shake out here over these final uh, five games. Yeah, and as we get a look at the video you took today at practice of Elias Lindholm skating, uh, he wasn't in line rushes. So, you know, as as we, we assume that means he's not going to play yet. Did we get an update from Talkit uh, after practice, Jeff? Or excuse me, after yeah, morning skate? He said he's close. He called him day to day now. We know that he skated out on the road trip in Los Angeles on Friday. Uh, this was a full morning skate, but coaches always make the distinction about uh, practices and game day skates. So I assume the Canucks will have a full practice on Tuesday, and maybe uh, we see Elias Lindholm back in the lineup for the Wednesday game against Arizona. Uh, whatever the case, it sounds like he is going to be back here before the end of the season, and just to see him out there on the ice. Took part in penalty killing drills this morning, but part of that's numbers, just because they need other guys, obviously, to work on the power play. But uh, yeah, wasn't involved in line rushes, will not play tonight. But uh, he's close. And just the fact that he was back around the group uh, is promising because while we saw Elias Lindholm, and you're right, uh, documented evidence there, courtesy of my iPhone, uh, sweet film, by the way, uh, <laughs> no sign of Thatcher Demko this morning. And that's not to say that he didn't skate, but where there were reports on the road that he joined the team at the end of practice, he did not for the morning skate today. Now, 
they're back home. It's easier for them to control their environment. He could have gone out at eight o'clock this morning with Ian Clark or, you know, at, at some other point away from the prying eyes. But that much I can tell you that Thatcher Demko was not involved with the group in any way as the Canucks went through their, their drills for the morning skate. Yeah, I keep saying it. I really hope they can get uh, Demko back and get him some starts before the playoffs. I heard Corey Schneider talking today about how hard it is to just jump right back into the playoffs. Obviously, that's something that he has some experience with. Uh, I just quickly wanted to ask you, and sorry, Harm, not to cut you off. I know you were going to ask a question, but Jeff, the, the one thing I wanted to ask you is just today, Stefan Roger, our colleague over at Canucks Army, wrote about the Canucks needing to get that band back together with uh, Teddy Bluger between Dakota Joshua and Connor Garland. Have you liked the look of JT Miller between those two guys? Do you like the flexibility that it provides you if Teddy Bluger's centering that line instead of JT Miller? What's your thoughts on uh, putting those three back together? Well, Dakota Joshua's looked good and obviously he's been productive here, scored three times already. Uh, you know, there were some that thought, oh, just wait till Dakota Joshua gets back. He's part of the penalty killing. He hasn't been able to make an impact in that regard yet, but it's never one guy. You know, the underlying numbers over the last five games, even like for Pedersen's line and for JT Miller with these new line mates, the underlying numbers are there. There's just no finish. And that's the surprising part that JT has been a finisher. JT's on a seven game point streak, which I was surprised when I looked at the game notes, because it just doesn't feel like he's been as loud uh, as he has been for much of the season, but only one goal in there. And that was that uh, set up by Connor Garland against the Dallas Stars. So you've got Pedersen, who's gone eight without a goal, and Miller has one in six. You know, those are your two best forwards. Even if Pedersen's not at the top of his game, I still consider him uh, one of their top two forwards. So, you know, you want to see a little bit more production, obviously, there. Um, there were moments, like I love the entry, obviously, in the play, the way JT slashed through the defense to set up Dakota Joshua. I mean, I, I wanted to see a bit more of that from the Vancouver Canucks as they went along. But I also can understand the reasoning to, you know, five games to go to try to get that third line back together. But this is the problem that you just wish that you had one or two candidates elsewhere in the lineup that you felt comfortable putting into the top six. And, you know, Pia Suter is going the other way. He's a healthy scratch and has his one goal since the All-Star break, which is uh, mind-boggling. Uh, when you think of like, the fact that you've got Mikheyev and Lafferty and Suter are all double digit goal scorers. And yet since Christmas, it's just been a massive struggle for any of those three guys to produce. So if you're going to take Dakota Joshua and Connor Garland and put them back in what we would call the third line role, then it just keeps exposing these holes elsewhere higher in the lineup. And if JT was able to do it on his own or Elias Pedersen was able to do it on his own, fine. But you know, when I look at, like, I know Besser scored the other night, but Besser, Hoaglander, and Pedersen, and we've talked about this, that, like, Petey can't use this excuse that he doesn't have wingers now. Like, those are two of, if not the two best wingers on this hockey club when it comes to goal scoring. And just collectively, like, I haven't seen an awful lot there, even if Pedersen had his moments in Los Angeles and did pick up the assist on the Besser goal. Hoaglander's gone a little bit quiet as well, scored the first goal in Vegas, but uh, he's kind of slipped back a little bit when it comes to finishing. So, um, you know, I'm not against the idea of trying Bluger, Joshua, and Garland because it certainly worked and you'd get some matchups lower in the lineup. But, you know, what do your top six look like there? Because I just don't know how you patch the holes uh, that exist if you take those two guys and drop them down onto a third line. If the Canucks lose tonight, they'll finish the season series against Vegas and L.A., one and three essentially not not accounting for not distinguishing between uh, regulation losses and ot losses um is there a psychological risk in that lack of success against la and vegas considering the high probability that you could run into one or if not both of those teams into the playoffs at some point i think it's a want it's not a need necessarily i think for the marketplace maybe uh, that's who would benefit most from a Canuck victory over the defending Stanley Cup champs. It's probably the marketplace, right? Like if you're the Canucks and you lose to Vegas tonight and then you ultimately end up drawing Los Angeles, like tonight's game really doesn't matter. The Kings don't care whether you beat the Golden Knights tonight. The Kings know what they've done against you in a four game season series. And we touched on that earlier. So, you know, I, I don't think really it matters. What it matters is to hold off Edmonton. And I still think that's maybe where some of the psychological damage comes in. When you've ridden atop the division all season, I have to go back and look at this, but I think 
in the week before Christmas, the Canucks were 19 points ahead of the Edmonton Oilers. If the Oilers come all the way back, beat them on Saturday, reel them in and, and clip them at the finish line, you know, the Canucks will downplay it. And they'll say, oh, we still got home ice advantage and it doesn't matter. We're not playing the Oilers in the round. All that kind of stuff. I still think a 19 point lead or 19, like, you know, that'd be like me getting a 50 yard lead on Usain Bolt essentially and trying to, <laughs> well, maybe that's not a great example because I, I still think we know how that one would end. Uh, but, but I think there is, there would be some, some scar tissue there that everything had gone so well for the Vancouver Canucks to see it all come kind of crashing down at the end. Ultimately, when you get to the playoffs, like you, I mean, you guys talk about all the time, wanting to beat your best and, you know, tune up your game for the postseason. I do think that the Canucks are going to hit the reset button once they learn their opponent. And then it's going to be on the coaching staff to come up with a game plan that's going to allow the Canucks to, to have some sort of uh, success come postseason. Now we'll see where Demko is in all of this. We'll see where Lindholm is. We talked about that. They're a better team with those guys in there, obviously. But no, I mean, look, it, it would be nice to see them sort of rise to the challenge here. Uh, one of these times against one of these Western Conference playoff teams because I, I'm i in the camp where I see all these people throwing out the numbers for the season, Canucks against playoff opponents. But look, five of the wins, three against Edmonton and two against Nashville, came in the first 12 games. Like those Oilers are not these Oilers now. And this is a Nashville team that just went on an 18-game heater. So you can't take the points off the board. The Canucks earned those on those nights. Do I think they would go 6-0 and if you lined up three games against each of the Oilers and the Predators right now? No, but I don't think they'd get swept either. So it's not to say that the record is completely invalid. But I do think context matters here. And we know the, the struggles and the scuffles. And, you know, McDavid wasn't fully healthy back then, even though he was in the lineup. He clearly wasn't at his best either. Canucks capitalized. They took advantage of the uh, early season schedule against the Edmonton Oilers. But, you know, the Oiler team that they saw back then, the one that they're going to see on Saturday, totally different. And so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, look, I I'm curious to see. I don't know that the Canucks have to beat Vegas tonight. If they want to finish first, they probably do. But for me, it's more about can you rise up? You know, what does the start look like? You know, do you look like you're spooked in any way? Vegas is getting Thomas Hurdle back. We'll see what kind of, uh, what he looks like in his return to game action in a while. You know, they are a good team. The Canucks saw that firsthand. And the other thing that's wild to me, guys, is like, it feels like Nikita Zdorov has been a Canuck for a long, long time. He wasn't with the team. I guess they traded for him the day that Vegas was last here in Vancouver on November 30th. So it's been a long time since the Golden Knights have been in Vancouver and I'm just excited. I'm excited to see the Stanley Cup champs and see what the Canucks do matching up against a team. As you said, I mean, there's still a pretty good chance that they could be a first round opponent here. And Jeff, just before we wrap up, like anecdotally, you've seen the car flags coming back out. Like this city feels like it's getting that buzz, even if the Canucks might be maybe limping a little bit to the finish line here. It feels like this city is starting to grasp on to playoff hockey. My question for you is, what do you remember about the last time this team was actually in the playoffs? Not the bubble, because uh, we all know what happened during the bubble. But the last time this team was in the playoffs, like, what's it like to see this city uh, become enamored with a playoff team? Well, I remember Willie Desjardins rolling his four lines when he had Daniel and Henrik. And, you know, he was trying to keep them fresh for a long series that ended uh, prematurely from the Canucks standpoint. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm still sort of spooked by the fact that as much as you want to believe home ice matters, like look at the Canucks record in starting series on home ice. The last time it mattered, they beat San Jose to get to the Stanley Cup final, but Boston beat them. The Canucks had home ice advantage. The next year, Los Angeles, San Jose swept them in 2013. The Canucks were the home, the better team in the higher seed. Calgary, you know, was the lower seed started on the road and they beat the Canucks. So there's a, a bit of a bad track record here but just in terms of the city <laughs> i i've maintained like for the people that dump on rogers arena and the people that sit in the lower bowl on their phones and aren't into it a flip a switch does flip come playoff time like i think rogers arena rocks come playoff time it just it hasn't had the opportunity obviously and in, in the better part of a decade but i'm excited like i think you're gonna feel almost 10 years of pent-up energy and emotion uh and that's why you'd like to see the home team go in on a little bit 
of a ride with some momentum here so that people don't feel like they're, you know, going to some sort of death march here to watch playoff hockey. Like, this is the payoff. It's been an incredible season. It's been so much fun. The Canucks have done and accomplished an awful lot to this point. But, you know, then you wipe the slate clean. I'm just excited to feel that energy. I think for me, more than anything, it's that feeling of energy at Rogers Arena. And I just, I want to believe in my heart that the fans that are going are going to feel like the Canucks have a chance to do something here come playoff time. So yeah, whether it's tonight against Vegas or Saturday in Edmonton, would like to see them rise up and sort of post one of these signature victories that just gives you a little bit more reason to believe that, yeah, this team actually can make something happen here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, you'll be there all through it all. And of yeah. course we have some games left. We have some games left and these games certainly do matter. You will be live after the game. Uh, on Rinkwide Vancouver. Second live show, Jeff. Looking forward to watching it. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, I got Irfin as my co-host tonight. So uh, looking forward to getting him on the live version. And uh, yeah, let's see what the Canucks look like against the defending Stanley Cup champs. Absolutely. There he is, Jeff Patterson, uh, who, as I said, will be live on the Rinkwide Vancouver uh, YouTube channel, the Twitter account. You can watch it. And of course, we're also uh, broadcasting that on the Canucks Army uh, Instagram as well. Jeff, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. There he is, Jeff Patterson. Um, Rinkwood Vancouver. Check it out. It's going to be a fun, it's a fun time. You can lo- interact live now. It's awesome. I loved it. I watched the first one. It was great. It was really, really nice. Although, Grady, why weren't the TVs on behind Jeff? I had to, I had to ask. I had to ask. I, I saw the TVs, the the LEDs. I want like, I, I would set the LED to like whatever color the Canucks were wearing that night. I always try to play with the LEDs when we go in studio at the wall center, but uh, we usually go with green. There was a lot of technical things going on that night. So uh, <laughs> we'll build for show number two. Fair enough. Fair enough. I want a pink uh, LED behind Jeff. I, that's what I think. Should rebrand uh, Canucks army and rink wide. To pink. There you go. There you go. Yep. That's right. Okay. There he was Jeff Patterson. Uh, let's move on. But before we do that, I need to tell you about our next sponsor, which is the Wendy's daily face off survivor pool game. The only thing sweeter than the taste of victory is starting your day with the new Cinnabon pull apart from Wendy's, but there's no reason you can't have both because Wendy's and daily face off survivor pool are giving you a chance to win weekly prizes all season long. And Hey, even if you make a few wrong picks, at least, you know, heading to Wendy's right now for a $5 Cinnabon pull apart and small coffee is a great choice. Sign up for Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool Fantasy today, sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. Okay, Harm, uh, previewing tonight's game a bit more. I touched on it a bit earlier. Really, really like the decision to go with Archer Seelovs. And what a pull by Jeff, bringing up the fact that uh, Seelovs was in that game against the Boston Bruins, which if memory serves, the Cubs only lost by a score of 3-1 to one or 4-1. to one. They were in it right till the end, and Seelovs definitely held up his end of the bargain in that game against the much better Boston Bruins. uh, Canucks are going to be hoping for something similar tonight against the Vegas Golden Knights. No doubt. And from Vancouver's perspective, what I'm most interested to see is how do they adjust to the newfound speed Vegas has found in transition? Because again, it, it just sort of felt like they were almost caught off surprise because again, they were going from the sleepy afternoon Sunday game against an Anaheim Ducks team that was on the second leg of a back to back to oh boy Vegas is rolling like they like and looking like they did when they won the Stanley Cup. So are you going to be able to contain Jack Eichel for example? This is a guy that took the game over and for as much as we were encouraged by what we saw from Elias Pettersson in, in the LA game for example, we haven't seen him take a game over like Jack Eichel did, right? So how do the Canucks respond defensively from that perspective and trying to slow Eichel, slow Eichel down, slow down their top 6? As, uh, as as a whole, and can they get back to that forecheck causing fits for um, Vegas' defenseman again? Because, again, at points in the season, that has been a difficulty for for, for the Golden Knights, including in, uh, in early March when the Canucks were at T-Mobile Arena playing against them. So really, I think it's, in terms of controlling 5-on-5 five five play, the biggest thing to watch for is can Vancouver slow down how quickly Vegas is able to advance up the up the ice um, and ensure that they don't get easy looks off the rush like they did last time. Yeah, and again, we'll see how they line up tonight. It looks like the lineup same, but again, the 11-7 formation, we'll see uh, 11 forward, 7 defensemen, of course. We'll see if they go with that. Uh, 
hard to say that they shouldn't at this point, but we'll see what happens tonight. Uh, perfect time for us to talk about Four Winds Brewing and our Light the Lamp contest. Vancouver is playing Vegas tonight, and we want to know who's going to score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media. Keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army or at Canucks Convo on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Winds Light, Light Lager at your local liquor store, or have some delivery to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. I am going with Elias Pettersson. I'm going to go with JT Miller. It's been a while, and again, he has this pattern of stepping up against top teams, so I'm uh, going to go with him. By the way, one more factor to watch for in this Vegas game. By the way, this might seem surprising considering the Golden Knights lit up the Canucks for two power play goals last time, but Vegas' power play since February 5th, which essentially is the end of the All-Star break, their power play ranks 30th in the NHL. Better than only Montreal and Philadelphia. And Vegas is a team that year in, year out, yes, they've been a Stanley Cup contender, but perennially their power play always held them back in the postseason. Last year was the first time that their power play was finally passable. And of course, we saw what happened in them actually winning the whole damn thing. So from Vancouver's perspective, this is this should be a get right game for their PK. I know you don't have Thatcher Demko or Elias Lindholm in yet, but you want this to be a game where you start trending in the right direction, shorthanded, especially if somebody like Noah Juleson draws back in the lineup. Because again, Vegas's power play has been worse uh, than uh, than Vancouver since the All Star break, and uh, that's something that was a bit surprising to me, considering how easily they um, they beat up on Vancouver on special teams last time. Something good to watch. Something good to watch for down the final stretch here. And Harm, I'm trying to do the math, and I'm not good at math, as you know. But I, I'm trying to look because Vegas, or excuse me, Edmonton has six games left, right? Vancouver has five left. Oilers are three points back of the Canucks. I'm just trying to figure out like final records over, like the Oilers just have to win one more game than the Canucks down the stretch to, oh no, two more games than the Canucks. Do I have that right? I don't think we should be doing this, uh, like mentally on the fly. No. Well, no. I, I we can do this. Let's put our brain power together. We can do this. Put both of our brain cells together, and we can figure this out. Come on, we, we got one and, we got, half, we one got and a half brain cells between us. That's right. That's right. I got the half. Um, like think about it, because there's three points back. I guess they can get an overtime loss in there. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. I don't know why we can't figure this out, but basically, okay. Edmonton beat Edmonton next plays against Vegas on Wednesday. That's their next game. So this is one thing I want to say about this game before we kind of move on to anyone else here. The Canucks should really want to win this game tonight for the sole reason that if Vegas beats them and if Vegas beats them handedly, you think Vegas is worrying too much about Edmonton on Wednesday? Like Vegas is probably going to be like, ah, we beat Vancouver, like that's a win on the road, whatever. Edmonton's coming up. But if the Canucks beat Vegas tonight, you gotta think they're looking for another gear against the Edmonton Oilers, right? Because because Vegas knows, like Vegas knows what time of year it is, and they know that you can't turn it on for the playoffs and a loss to the Canucks tonight. Maybe Vegas goes into Edmonton trying a little bit harder to go get that win. I don't know. Am I on to something here? Uh I don't think so because there's a decent chance that Vegas plays Edmonton in the playoffs anyway, whether it's round one or, or round two. And with that in mind, considering how close we are to the playoffs, regardless of if they beat the beat the Canucks or not, they're not letting their foot off the gas against um, against Edmonton. They have the upper hand um, because of last time in the playoffs. So you would you would want to keep your foot on the gas pedal and maintain that psychological edge going into the postseason. That hey. As the Oilers, you, you you can't. You're a good team, but you can't beat us. I'm very curious. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about that game? Because I, before we get to anyone else, I did want to just bring up the Eastern Conference playoff picture because it is, uh, it's it's the same snooze fest finish that we're headed for. But we don't know who's going to make the playoffs. Like right now, the Detroit Red Wings, all at 77 games. All these teams, keep in mind, okay, except for the Flyers who are at 78. But all these teams at 77 games played. 
The Red Wings have 84 points. The Pittsburgh Penguins have 83 because Sidney Crosby is deciding to drag the carcass of the Penguins into the playoffs, potentially. The Washington Capitals also have 83. The Philadelphia Flyers also have 83. Like I said, they have 78 games, not 77 played. But man, what's going to happen in the East? Like, who's coming out of that? Is, is it Detroit who sits in the second wildcard spot right now? I hope it's Pittsburgh, just because I want to see Sidney Crosby yeah. at uh, his best. And I don't know if you caught the end of that Pittsburgh-Tampa game, but it was unbelievable theater watching Tampa uh, come from behind and erase a multi-goal deficit. The air almost seemed to go out of the build building at uh, PPG Paints Arena. And then for Pittsburgh to claw back and score that late goal. And Tampa had a late power play too. And even as they were pulling the goalie, the number of chances that they have, Nadelkovic made a fantastic save. Like that was one of the best endings I've ever seen for a regular season game. Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And uh <laughs> Again, I'm with you right there. I really hope uh, I really hope it's the Penguins that pull it out there. I just wanted to kind of highlight this. I know Jake Gensel got traded and everything, but Sidney Crosby leads the Penguins in goals with 40. Second place. Second place behind Crosby. Brian Rust with 26. And then Evgeny Malkin with 25. And then from there, it ain't pretty. It, nobody else has 20 goals on the Penguins. And Crosby's just been absolutely carrying that team. The only reason I wouldn't want them to make the playoffs is because it decreases the chance that we'll ever see Crosby in Vancouver. Uh, I haven't sent my letter yet. I haven't even written it yet. It's more of a mental thing at this point. But I might not even send the letter if they make the playoffs because why would Crosby want to leave that situation? I don't know. Like, if they miss the playoffs, maybe Crosby listens to me and comes to Vancouver. But I don't, I don't know if he's going to listen to my letter at this rate. Yeah, especially the way the Canucks are trending. Um, but hey, at least in crafting your letter, make sure you talk to Rutherford before, right? Because he knows Sid really well. He'll know how to appeal. Maybe make it a joint letter between the two. He'll co -sign. <laughs> yeah, he'll co-sign on the letter. He'll co-sign on the letter and it might work. It might actually work. Okay, uh, let's get to... Can you Speaking imagine Sid seeing a, a letter from Jim Rutherford and be like, who the hell is David Quadrelli? <laughs> I can't imagine it, Harm. It's a dream. It's a dream of mine. Uh, speaking of some uh, silly shenanigans, let's get to anyone else. Brought to you by DoorDash. It's our listener's chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter the code NATION25. That's all capital letters, NATION, and the numbers 25. Off of in Canada, subject to change. Terms do apply. Uh, all right, get them in the chat, Grady. We've got a bunch I saw earlier. I want to get these. Anyone else? <clears throat> I'll ask you this one, Harm. Um, this one from Jesse C. Prior to seeing Lindholm with the Canucks, would you have said he was a viable option at wing instead of center in Tockett system? I'll go first. As the guy who was clamoring for Lindholm since the start of the season, I only pictured him as a winger, and I pictured him as being maybe being able to take face-offs and then swap with Elias Pettersson. Like, let's make no mistake about it. Elias Lindholm was acquired to be Elias Pettersson's winger. Has not worked out to this stage, but that's that's what the team thought. That's what I thought, uh, and I'm assuming that's also what you thought, Harm. Yeah, especially because Lindholm had a history of playing wing in, uh, in Carolina, so you're like, okay, the proof of concept is there. He's been successful as a winger at the NHL level before. And there isn't anything in particular about the way the Canucks play under Rick Tockett that would have been a red flag for Lindholm's fit as a winger on the Canucks specifically. Uh, I wanted to quickly shout this out because someone brought up baseball in the chat because Jays Mariners have a series here. Um, speaking of snooze fests, yeah, the Jays and Mariners are playing two of the worst teams in Major League Baseball so far this season, uh, just in terms of entertainment value. Um, talking about the Jays Mariners series, I just want to say Vancouver Canadians kick off their series tomorrow. Folks, go support the Seas. Go watch some baseball. It's a great, it's a great environment. Even if you don't like baseball, like Harm, you can you can speak to this. Even if you don't like baseball, a Vancouver Canadians game is a great time. Yeah. Definitely, the hot dogs are amazing. I only half pay attention to the games, but they're um, they're unbelievable to, to attend anyway. BCHL playoffs, a lot of different sporting events uh, that you can go out and support. Look, those Canucks tickets are expensive. If you don't want to go to the Canucks, go check out a Vancouver Canadiens game. Go check out the Coquitlam Express, baby. Taking on Port Alberni tomorrow. I'm going to try not to continue down this road, but something to think about. A lot of different sporting events coming to Vancouver. And again, 
Like, I, I want people to support the Seas because one day, have you seen this? Vancouver has been brought up a couple of times as an expansion option for Major League Baseball. Oh boy, we're you're leaving this podcast the second that happens, doesn't it? You you may never see me ever again. <laughs> if, if, if Major League Baseball comes to Vancouver, you may not hear me talk about hockey ever again. I kid, I kid. Um, but I think there'd be a lot more baseball talk on this show. I'll tell you what. I can tell you this Mariners hat would go in the trash probably if Vancouver got a baseball team. Oh my gosh. Okay. Anyways, no more baseball talk. No more, no more baseball talk. Um, yeah, this is great. This is Captain Canuck. The Jays suck, but they're still better than the Mariners. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Um, Yeah. Andrew, Harm's eating a hot dog right now. You brought up the hot dogs. Hot dog blog. Bane suggested that in the YouTube live chat. Lots of different options here. Uh, Lots of different options. Okay. No more baseball talk. I've said it a few times. Um, Did you see this, Harm? I wanted to bring this up. Travis Green uh, with Peter Laviolette. We saw him getting that torts-like, you know, torts-like experiment and just kind of... Someone asked me to break this down, so I will. So basically what happened is the saga starts with Matt Rempe, who's that 21-year-old kind of enforcer uh, with the New York Rangers. He throws a hit on... Who'd he hit? Was it Siegenthaler. Siegenthaler, okay, yeah. Uh, hit Siegenthaler, and Curtis McDermott went to go fight him, and he basically declined, which is in his right to do, but uh, McDermott kind of had, had some shots for him post game, and, you know, talked about how he lost a lot of respect for him that night and everything. So Travis Green and the New Jersey Devils go into MSG for their next game. Visiting coach submits his lineup first. Travis Green does the old Bob Hartley thing. He submits his line is with his fourth line, Curtis McDermott, starting uh, Peter Laviolette, the head coach of the New York Rangers, counters with his fourth line. A little bit, I guess John Tortorella is Peter Laviolette in this instance, but uh, a little bit different situation. Uh, the fourth lines go toe-to-toe, and of course, there's a line brawl to start the game. I watched Travis's post-game thing. It was the most passionate. It was the most... Uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a typical Travis Green post game press conference where it was look that's a good team over there. Uh, it was more not, I don't want to say animated. It's a hard but league it, to fight in. It's a hard league to fight in. Uh, give them credit. That's a good team over there. No, we didn't hear any of that. Uh, you know, he kind of just said I don't know what anyone's surprised about after what happened last game. Travis basically just said this is what this is what was going to happen. Uh, I don't know why anyone's surprised about it, that sort of thing. And Laviolette didn't have much to say, but um, you know, Travis did address the whole screaming it match with Laviolette, and he said, I looked over and Laviolette was yelling at me, so I went and yelled back. If you're gonna yell, you're gonna get yelled back at. And this reminded me, do you remember this harm? This is very niche. Ryan Reeves, when he was a member of the Vegas Golden Knight, do you remember him and Travis Green getting into a shouting match in the bubble? I do vaguely yeah so ryan reeves for whatever reason starts barking at travis green specifically on the connects bench and travis didn't like that very much and he was barking right back at ryan reeves and it just it reminded me that that was the first thing it reminded me of i know obviously there was the uh the torts comparison with what happened in 2014 between the canucks and the flames but that was the first thing i thought of uh was the the yelling match with travis and ryan reeves okay uh this one from RP88, do you think we see the lotto line again before the end of the regular season? I don't think so. I suspect that Tockett looks at it as a break glass in case of emergency type option. Uh, now, could the odds of us seeing that lotto line as a plan B, C, or, or D option increase once Elias Lindholm draws back draws back into the lineup? Yeah. Uh, I do think so, but I'd be surprised if Tockett goes back to it um, as a default option when he's putting his lines together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of what that emergency scenario would be. I don't think you want to do it in the playoffs. And I also also just don't I know. Mean, well, if you're struggling to generate offense in the playoffs, they might go to it. And like, yeah. let's say you're chasing a game, you're down by a goal or two. Nothing's really clicking. It's It's worth a shot. I know, I just, I, Harm, I'm trying to think of the last time we saw that line have success together, though. Because remember the last time we saw it together? They had one Dude, great it was shift together. One, it was, okay, you They get tanked. Yeah, so you're never going to go back to it because they had one bad shift. Yeah, they're the first line in NHL history to have haven't a gone, bad shift. Haven't gone back to it since. They haven't gone back to it since, Harm. And that's fine, but lately they haven't had Elias Lindholm, which 
now your team lacks so much secondary depth that you can't go to it. I'm so not this saying analogy they should... basically is that your break glass in case of emergency is a fire extinguisher. That's what the analogy is. But this fire extinguisher is either going to shoot out the foam that puts out fires or it's going to put out like more flames. You don't know what it's going to put out. That's what this analogy really is. Your break glass in case of emergency is like, all right, this could either make things way worse or it could make things better. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll remember. The next time one player has one bad shift, I'm going to be like, yeah, forever. You can't ever trust them defensively again. But, I mean, we saw... Look, we saw how dominant they were in January together. And, yeah, towards the tail end, did they have that same level of dominance and chemistry? No. But when they were first put together, I mean, they had a stretch of games where they were unstoppable offensively. When's the last time the Canucks have had an unstoppable line offensively? The last time the Canucks have had an unstoppable line offensively is when the lotto line was put together. <laughs> and you know what, Harm? The, the last time, in all seriousness, the last time you and I had this conversation about lotto line, the thing that I pointed out was the last time they had success, that Bluger Joshua Garland line was absolutely humming, right? Like it, it can't just be yeah. the lotto line. And again, I'm, I'm not saying that's why they failed, but I, I am saying that that did play a part in their success for sure. His team's having to respect that line uh, that was playing so, so well behind them but again we'll we'll see I, i'm curious if we do see them before the end of the regular season um but yeah I don't, I don't know we'll see anything else you wanted to get to before we wrap up here uh no i think uh, i think we're okay by the way just to close out the lotto conversation it's a similar sort of analogy as when the oilers put mcdavid and dry settle together late in games or when they're trailing like you don't want to do it because then your other lines aren't deep enough but sometimes when you're struggling to manufacture offense, you, you roll the dice and, and see what you've got. And sometimes it does give you that extra boost offensively at the top of your lineup that uh, that you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it, again, it is it is in all seriousness. It is their break glass in case of emergency. So we'll see. We'll see if that emergency comes before the end of the season. We'll see if it comes tonight when the Canucks take on the Vegas Golden Knights. Make sure you tune in to rink wide post game immediately. Uh, wherever you want. You can see it on the YouTube channel for Rinkwide. You can see it live streamed on the Canucks Army social channels. Uh, but if you're on Twitter, Rinkwide Vancouver is the social channel that you will want to check out. Uh, post-game coverage, live, interactive. Check it out with our man, Jeff Patterson, after the game. We'll be back tomorrow in studio to break down this game uh, and talk about so much more. Cam Robinson's going to join us on tomorrow's show, so looking forward to that. Uh, but we'll close it out for now. Oh, no, I have to tell you one more thing forgot to tell you and i should be telling you about this because i'm very excited for it saturday april 20th join canucks conversation and the rest of the canucks army crew at 1 p.m saturday april 20th at the hollywood theater in kitsilano for a special tribute to our late friend jason botchford presented by fountain tire bro do your playoffs is a media event celebrating the life and legacy of jason that will feature shared memories special guests an exclusive performance from the matinee and the celebration of vancouver's triumphant return to the playoffs bro do your playoffs is in support of the bc mental health foundation get your tickets now at nationgear.ca and as i mentioned this event is brought to you by fountain tire right now at fountain tire being on the road together means getting a great deal on tires save up to 25 percent on select tires including goodyear until april 20th book your appointment at fountaintire.com and as we head further into spring ask the fountain tire experts about their seasonal car package to keep your vehicle in top shape find your nearest service dealer at fountaintire.com all right we'll close it out there for my co-host harman dial and our technical producer grady sass my name is dave quadrelli thank you so much for listening to an episode of the Canucks Conversation. Thanks for watching this video. For more great content from Canucks Army, check out Sakaris and Price, Rinkwide Vancouver, or our show, Canucks Conversation, where your one stop shop for interviews, breaking news, and a live Canucks post game show hosted by Jeff Patterson. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives the BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. 
Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.